Hello, hello guys. You're about to see how I finally made it to 2500 and it actually, <laughs> it actually happened three times. And even though I'm only going to show you the recording of the first one, which is this one in front of you, and I'm going to show it to you mainly for you to see how I did not even consume time thanks to our peers defense, right? But we lost again. And then finally, this is the game that I showed you guys where I made it to 2501. And I showed you this one because there was a cool five uh, forced five move checkmate um, that we got from this position. So my opponent took the knight and then we had a forced checkmate in five moves. So feel free to calculate everything just as practice. And let's get guys to the very first game where we made it to 2500. By the way, before we get to it, notice that this one guys was also with the peers defense. Austrian attack, we talked about this C5 in lesson number 73 but anyhow let's get to it uh here you can see me guys my opponent took his time to do his uh his first move but then we started with e4 d6 and i'm so glad that he chose the variation that he chose my opponent decided to play the burn variation and thanks to everything that we covered on lesson number i want to say 92 96 i did not use any of my time in the opening guys because I remembered everything. And I know that a lot of you, that was a long lesson that we had, one of the worst, one of the longest lessons we've had. And I know that a lot of you, it was too long for you guys. But I gave you two ways that you could play against the burned variation. One, it was to simply do um, after e5, which is what my opponent did. You could do pawn takes pawn, or you could have done knight f to d7. Now here, notice how my opponent took like probably like 20, 30 seconds because he's trying to understand what's wrong with my move. This knight g4 doesn't seem to be accurate, but it actually is. This is theory. And I'm pretty sure that the remaining of the game, that's what my opponent was trying to do, trying to look for a way to punish my king in the center. But again, if you don't like this variation, you could choose the other one that I told you before where instead of accepting it, you go knight f to d7. Now, the only problem with pawn takes pawn, guys, is when you do queen takes d1, and then their rook occupies the open file. But here, we're going to be fine. You're going to see that uh, he ended up just taking my queen, king is in the center, bishop d7. It looks ugly, but I'm putting so much pressure on e5 that you're going to be, we're always going to be fine. Now, main ideas that I remembered, I want to do knight c6, I want to move my king back to e8, getting away from the, the pin. And then finally, um, I want to bring my rooks to d and fa. So this is all thematic. We had a lesson on these pawn sacrifices, but again, we are going to be fine here. So now I think my opponent did something like knight f3. And one more time, the plan that we learned was knight c6, ready to do knight e5, king goes to e8, and bring my rooks to the open files. One more thing that I haven't mentioned is that we are supposed to do bishop takes e3. Typically, we don't give up our fianchetto bishop, but in this case, guys, we want to mess up the queenside pawn structure. Now, again, look, I have three minutes, guys. If you haven't noticed, this is move number 10. My opponent is uh, has 45 seconds left. I have my three minutes, king e8, back to three minutes again, because I know all of this inside out. Many of you said, back in that in that lesson you told me in the comments that you don't like this variation because the king is in the center or because you want the queens to remain well precisely because the queens are off the board my king is happy it's safe in the center so again my opponent is trying to figure out what's wrong with this variation how come i cannot do anything and now i should have done bishop takes e3 i took too long i didn't remember everything but i did remember the ideas and i ended up doing it Now, finally, I think I took on c3, and this is one more time to just get him doubled isolated pawns. And you're going to see that even though it didn't go exactly as the theory said, or as we covered it, I ended up bringing my rook to the f file, to f5. And if I remember correctly, the, the variation that we talked about ended up with our rook on f5. And that will give us slightly advantage for the black pieces. So knight f8, I wanted to defend the pawn on e6. Typically, 
I don't really care if they take it. And but you know, I tried my best <laughs> to hold on to it. So here I calculated a little bit. I saw this position where they take on e6, but again, I remembered rook f5 was thematic and it was recommended. So now, thanks to the pawn, the poor pawn structure that they have on the queen side, I'm going to go rook a5, give me the pawn once I take it. If you remember, guys, the very good lesson we had on rook endgames, we only need one passed pawn. Here, I considered, okay, they could take on h7, but then after I take this pawn, it is three connected passed pawns. And one of the things that we learned in that lesson is that two connected passed pawns on, on the sixth rank could be even more powerful than a rook. So here I'm taking my time. Rook c6, happy to trade because my king is in the, the square of their pawns. We cannot say the same thing about their king. So that's it. Now we just promote. And that's basically, guys, the, the end of the game. That's it. I think my opponent ended up blundering or running out of time, something like that. Yeah, we got the rook and that was the end of the game. There you go, guys. Now, let me show you quickly here. Accuracy was 96.7, but it was mainly because, again, I remembered most of the game from the lesson that we had on this variation of the peers. So with that said, I hope that you found some value in this lesson, and I will see you guys in our next video.